Perfect. Hey everyone, great to have you here. This is going to be a fantastic event. I am more than blown away. I actually didn't even expect to get such an amazing um, turn up for it and then also the questions. So this is get your first thousand sales and this is a panel Q and A. Um, it's all of your important questions uh, answered for you. So I've asked everyone to provide me with some questions beforehand. I've had more than 70 come through, so I'm doing my best to break them all down. Um, if we don't get through them all here, I will actually be putting together podcasts or videos with those questions. And then maybe some of the guys that are here on the panel might use some of those questions themselves for their own things. So this is going to be fantastic. We're going to move really fast. I'm going to turn off that little chime because we don't need to hear that. Um, I'm going to say hello to everyone that's here at the moment, all of our panel guests and introduce them. They can each quickly tell you who they are. So then you can understand what they are going to be helping with today. So we'll start with Brett. I see him next to me on the video screen. So we'll start there. We've got Brett Owens and Brett, he's awesome. I've just, we just did an interview the other day again. We've done quite a few things together. So Brett, do you want to just let everyone know what your two websites are and what you can actually, what you specialize in? Sure, you bet. So we've got Influencer for Influencer Marketing. So A-F-L-U-E-N-C-E-R.com and then Elite Dino for Affiliate Marketing. So we'll talk Influencer and Affiliate Marketing or anything else related that you'd like to uh, touch off on. Fantastic. Then we've got Nina. Nina, just tell us about you, Miss Pinterest Guru. <laughs> yes, I, I do Pinterest Marketing. So any questions about um, how to rank on the world setting? second largest uh, search engine, um, let me know. And you can find me on profitablepin.com or ninacolari.com. Fantastic. And then we've got Ruth there. Ruth, tell us about your excellent app. Everyone needs to know about it. Uh, so I have a, an app called Reconvert that helps you improve your customer retention through the thank you page for Shopify. And you can find us at stillyourapps.info. Fantastic. And last and not least, Nick, tell us about your website and what you do. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, as Caroline said, my name's Nick. Um, I work a lot on SEO, PPC. Uh, so we're helping websites get to the top of Google, running advertising campaigns, but also working on brand position because it's all very well driving traffic, but you want it to convert. Um, our website is spec.digital. So, um, yeah, go and check it out. Fantastic. So let's start off with one of the first questions that I have here. Like I said, let's just go as fast as possible. I'm going to start with you, Nick. Um, organic SEO, one of the ladies, Amanda, she has got a lingerie website and she wants to know about organic SEO. So can you just give us a few tips for people starting up, getting their first thousand sales, what that looks like for organic SEO? I think, yeah, I think one of the challenges you've got with SEO is it can take a bit of time to get traction. So in terms of the first thousand sales, um, I would focus on real niches. So I would actually look at the naming of your categories. That's something we do a lot for businesses. And then actually how we break those categories into subcategories. Um, a really good example in the UK at the moment, and we're not affiliated with them at all, is New Look. If you go and search uh, New Look Orange Dress and have a look at that Orange Dress category, it's my go-to at the moment in terms of how to categorize products. Um, you can shop by color, by style, by um, material, by size. They have a category for everything and it's really well positioned. Um, I'd recommend starting with something quite simple like that and use Keyword Planner on Google as well. Um, that will tell you how many people are searching up particular things. Um, you probably want to aim, certainly across Europe and the UK, you probably want to aim um, sort of 500 to 1,000 searches a month as a keyword to target. In the US, I'd go slightly bigger, slightly bigger market and slightly less competitive um, across the whole of the US. Um, Brett might have a different idea on that as he's, uh, I'm assuming he's based over there. But um, that's what I would say. I'd say start with some keywords in Google Planner and then look at how you're naming categories. Just drive people straight to product. Beyond that, write some blog posts and try and solve some very specific problems, but make sure people are Googling those problems first. So there's no point trying to answer some, um, trying to come up with an answer for a question that nobody's actually looking up. So um, that's where I would focus my time if I was looking for my first 1,000 sales. Fantastic. Um, the next question is going to start off with Ruth. So Ruth, I want you to start off with this and then Nick might be able to give some, um, I, some extra advice and maybe someone else wants to jump in. So the question from Ronaldo, he's got a website called Selected Leaf. I'm not sure what that is. Some of the websites I looked at, so many questions. I didn't have time to look at everything. Um, the question is, how can I know that the customer experience is okay? So Ruth, that's a good one for you. 
Um, yeah, that's actually a great question because you really need your customer experience to be good if you want them to come back and buy from you again. Um, generally, just talk to your customers and there's a lot of ways to do that. You can do it through a live chat on your website or through email. Um, and a lot of people take email marketing to be something that you have to sell through. But you can also use email marketing just to reach out and see how your customers are feeling about the purchase experience, about the product, to hear some of their feedback. And one of the things that we want, we really like to recommend is for uh, brands to actually add a post-purchase survey on the thank you page, because that way your customer just finished the purchase and you're already asking him how it went and the experience is fresh in his mind. So the answers are probably going to be more accurate than if you wait a week. Fantastic. And Ruth, can you just let everyone know you were on my podcast a couple of weeks ago and that's why mm -hmm. I wanted you on here. Can you just let everyone know just quickly what you do with the thank you page? Because it's very unique and I think that more people should be doing it. And the fact that your app is free when you're starting out, it's just fantastic yeah. for everyone. Sure. So uh, Reconvert is, like I said, an app for Shopify specifically. Um, and basically what we do is we just look at the big, big, e-commerce stores like uh, Amazon and Walmart and eBay. And if you really look at what they do with their thank you page, they really utilize it to already uh, increase customer retention. So you can basically, from the thank you page, buy some more products, you get product recommendations, discounts, invites to join the membership club. So what we do is just allow merchants from Shopify to actually do all of that on their own thank you page. And you can add app sales and pop-ups, uh, collect emails, collect um, uh, post-purchase survey answers, a lot of different things that you can just use the thank you page and get customers to re-engage with you before they leave your website. Yeah, it's fantastic. And you can't do this any other way. There's no way of doing this as a page on Shopify. So it's fantastic. It's really worth getting hold of that app. Nick, do you have anything else to add to that about the customer, ex customer experience? Yeah, I think that was re I really love the answer actually of kind of what to do post sale. I think where I come in is probably pre sale and actually how do you get the sale to happen? Um, I definitely think there's, there's two things I'd raise on this. One of them is um, don't just assume customers are right. And I take that very lightly. And what I mean by that is you, your customer might have a very clear idea of what they want, but you could direct them something completely different. You could say, okay, I need some shoes to wear outdoors. But actually, once I start searching and looking, I actually decide I don't want shoes for outdoors at all. Actually, these slippers look amazing. I'm going to buy these. So don't always assume customers right. And I think that's where product recommendation things can be really key. Um, equally, on the flip side of that, I would say go back to basics with marketing in the sense that what, what, what does your business stand for? What problem is it trying to solve? Um, there's been so many, certainly in the UK, so many retailers that they're just, they're just products. They don't really have a story or a brand and a lot of them are going, um, going under at the moment um, and closing down. So I would say keep it really, really strong. And I think even if you're eco-friendly, that's probably not enough anymore. You've got to come up with a different edge, a problem you're trying to solve, a reason for somebody to shop from you. So, um, so yes, that'd be my advice on um, building a good uh, customer experience. Fantastic. Anyone else? Anything else to add? This is a really good question. So... No, nope, nothing else. We'll keep moving. I'm not going to stop for too long. I've got one here from Carolina, or Carolina, depends how much, how she wants to pronounce it, how to run affiliate programs well. Once we get an influencer on board, what's next? How do we manage their activities? How do we manage multiple influencers promoting our product at the same time? Brett, that one's for you. Got it. Sounds good. So if we're talking about, we've got our very first influencer, we've got our very first affiliate, and this is maybe this is the person that we're excited to be working with. What I would recommend doing is, is talking to that person, seeing what they have in mind in terms of a co-promotion. This could be a we could hop on a webcast like this. They may do posts on social media. This may be something on their website. See where their heads are at and see what types of promotions usually work well for them and then see how you can support them. So that's going to be our one person. This Maybe this is somebody we're excited to be working with. As we start getting our second, third, fourth, 40th person, 400th person that we're working with, we need a way that we can kind of corral all of our partners. And that's where we're going to look to apps, tools such as uh, Lead Dino, my own. Uh, that, that's one of uh, the types of products that 
helps Shopify merchants take a, a pool of partners, resellers, and give them all the kind of a toolkit that they need to be able to pro promote your links and traffic to your store on uh, social media via those other means. So I think it's always good to give that individual attention to the influencers, to the affiliates who, is, who have that reach. Uh, but then you also want to try to make your program as broad as you can because sometimes you, you never quite know who's going to be an impact person until they start working with you. They send you a bunch of traffic and you're thrilled about it. And that's when you reach out from there. So combination of that approach and then also using the tool uh, that are available to be able to extend your reach on your partner program. Fantastic. So I had quite a few questions at, about the same sort of thing. So they're very, um, it's all about free traffic, traffic, how to get traffic to your website. So that was one that I saw one, two, three, four, five, six, um, seven times the same sort of question, all different, but slightly um, in the same space. And Nina, I want you to start with it because I think that now anyone who's listened to our podcast together, and I just had someone reach out yesterday, Nina, and say, that workshop is amazing. They're like, Nina is absolutely amazing. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Pinterest traffic because I think overall this question is, what's the single most important step when an e-commerce business is starting out to get reliable traffic? Another one is, what should a startup focus on as one source of traffic? The next one is, uh, where should I focus on? The next one is, best ways to drive traffic that converts to sales? All of these sort of questions all mean the same thing. And really, I think the first thing is, is that I can say as a marketing person, is that there's no one way to do it. There's a couple that we really recommend at the moment for e-commerce, Pinterest, Instagram, those are sort of the main two. Facebook, I would class as third. If you've got men's products, then Twitter. But Pinterest is such a great place. So I want to start there. So Nina, why don't you tell us a little bit about why Pinterest would be so good and how people could use that as a free traffic source? Well, Pinterest is a search engine more than it's like a social media site. You People that go into Pinterest, they go there to look for a product or they want to learn something. Maybe they want to cook a dinner. So there's always, they focus on themselves rather than chatting with friends and family. So they're there for a reason. And because it's a search engine, um, as a marketer or seller, it's like ranking on Google. It's the same thing you can rank on Pinterest. And once you rank on, on Pinterest, you can get same traffic as you can get from Google. It doesn't disappear. It just stays and, and the pins just get better in time. So it might take a little bit time to get started, but it's, you know, evergreen. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not going to be here to the end of the, you know, um, next decade, but um, it is still long-term traffic. And you can, to get those first sales or get those first ranks, you do need to, niche it down like Nick said for Google that's the same thing you can't be offering everything to everybody you really need to narrow it down to even to a single product and start with that get that ranking and then start expanding and really making um, mark on Pinterest on all your products fantastic and so you've done some workshops with me already yeah. we really speak about um, creating a couple of pins so do you want to just run through just like very, very quickly what that looks like. So if someone wants to use Pinterest and they think, well, hang on, I've never used it before. What does that look like for someone who's just starting out? Um, if you just want to start out, the easiest way is to literally um, download a um, Chrome add-on for Pinterest that where you can pin a, um, an, any image on any website. Um, download that Chrome add-on and then go to your website and pin, literally pin every image you have onto your Pinterest account. So that's by far the easiest. Ideally, you should have a little bit more lifestyle images or people using the product rather than just the usual product image with the white background. But that white background works sometimes. So that's the, by far the easiest way to get started. Fantastic. Anyone else with some advice? Let's talk about free traffic and how to get free traffic to websites. So like I was saying before, that's really the question is, what's the number one source? What do I use? Nick, do you have any ideas about that? Yeah, I thought I might share something because SEO is 
generally considered the free traffic source. Um, I would challenge it a little bit because I would say actually um, SEO services are not free and creating content is not free and building and launching a website is also not free. Um, what, I would, what I would suggest in terms of getting free traffic is probably look at, I think SEO needs to become the sort of second thought on everything. And that's coming from an SEO person. It's still important. I mean, like you said, Caroline, there's so many things in that list. But for me, it's a kind of secondary thing under everything else. And it's actually you used the word evergreen as well in, in your other response. And I, I think evergreen is a good way of putting it. Actually, if you were to get some PR activity or get an Instagrammer to mention you, um, we're working with a health supplement as an example at the moment. Um, and these guys, uh, somebody shared their story on the Times. Now, because, and that's a news, uh, newspaper in the UK, and because we're not allowed under advertising standards authority, we're not allowed to put testimonials or any un, kind of, they're called medical studies. And that's an official medical study we can't talk about on the website. But as soon as this article went up, we actually directed all of our PPC traffic to this article. But the website rankings as a result have come up within two or three days of the article going live. Because there's this huge buzz now and they had 30, 40 comments, some saying, wow, this is too expensive, but some saying this is really cool. Um, and I sort of said, well, how, how did you get that article? Let's get more of them. And they said, we had no idea. We had no idea one of our customers had phoned a journalist and gone, everybody needs this in their life. Um, and so that's one way they're generating free traffic, which is really interesting. I think for me, it's then the underlying thing is the SEO, the PPC, some of your social media, your email campaigns, your website content. What do you do next with that thing? I think is actually where the free stuff starts to come. So I would say if a particular Instagram have bought your product, ask them to feature it or, you know, as Brett said, why don't you um, have a conversation with them and say, how do you guys want to work with us? Do we, would you like your own product range? Um, that's something that a few of our clients, certainly a few of our smaller Shopify clients have done really well from is launching a range for a particular blogger. But um, yeah, I'd kind of, I'd do all of that activity with your kind of groundwork SEO in place and that activity will boost your groundwork because it creates social proof, creates links, it creates reviews and all that sort of stuff as well. Yeah, I love it. Anyone else with anything else, Brett? Yeah, sure. Yeah, just to piggyback on what uh, Nick and, and Nina both said, absolutely. One thing that I know comes up a lot with new merchants, they always want to know what they should do first. And I encourage them to get a few things going at a time. So if we look at SEO, I tell them, you absolutely want to do SEO. SEO is great. It's the gift that keeps on giving. And it's also, as Nick said, it's going to take time. So you need to start it now. You also can't expect results two months from now. So the quickest way to get that, those first thousand sales, it, it may not be SEO because it's going to take Google, the internet overlord some time to, to formally bless your site. So while you do want to start that right away, you want to think quick in terms of getting your first sales. So that could be pay-per-click often. Google or Facebook are going to be the quickest way to get traffic to your website. The influencer affiliate side could also be a good way if you can get that quick promotion going. So you want to get a few irons in the fire. It does take time. Some of them develop are, are slower to develop than others. Uh, start working on those multiple channels uh, at once. You don't want to necessarily spend a month on uh, SEO and then say, well, that didn't work. Well, SEO rarely works in a month. So you want to uh, get your plan going in place and get a few things going at one time. Fantastic. Anyone else? No one else at the moment? Yeah, I, I actually just want to add um, one little thing. I really agree with what everyone said, but from my experience, one of the best ways to get almost free traffic to your website is actually affiliate marketing. Um, what we did is specifically reach out to YouTubers and YouTubers in our niche with very small channels. So it could be a thousand to 10,000 followers, but if they have good engagement, and good views on their uh, videos, then it could be a really good opportunity because they're small enough that they're not gonna ask you for money to actually promote you, just for the product. And it's good in a way that it's both um, instant because it's an affiliate, uh, an influencer that is advertising your product, but it's also YouTube, it's a huge search engine and it's gonna stay there and this is also an evergreen kind of traffic source. Tell us a little bit, Ruth, because I didn't mention that before. You've actually had your own brand. You spoke about it on my podcast. You had your own brand and you sold it to do the app. Yeah. Um, what were you doing with YouTube? What's the, what was the product and was your audience in Israel or was it worldwide? What was the situation with that? Yeah, so the audience was uh, worldwide and the store was basically a, it's a, it was a very specific product, niche store for kind of a cool gardening product. And we had some um, extra cheaper products to upsell with, but it was one major expensive one that we wanted to promote. 
and just because it was kind of uh, viral by nature, because it, it's very cool, um, it, it worked really well to just use influencers. And even though Instagram has the name of being the platform for influencers, what I've found is YouTube with video and with traffic that keeps coming through these videos, is a, it's an amazing source to actually use to get traffic to your store. Yeah. So if anyone doesn't know, I've got the summit coming up. It starts in a month from now. It's the winning with Shopify summit. So it's winning with Shopify.com slash summit. And that's all we talk about is influencer marketing and Ruth's completely right when it comes to that. It's, it's just amazing what YouTube can do. I've got a guy on there. He's actually got his own podcast, Mike, and he talks about just using YouTube for his affiliate marketing and the amazing results he gets. So definitely recommend what Ruth's saying. It's definitely right. So Brett, to you, because we're talking about affiliate marketing, that's your whole niche. You know about that. Ruth knows about it from the perspective of being the actual store owner and you know from it because of Lead Dino. I've got a question here from Tanika and she says, um, I have a small marketing budget at the moment. What would you recommend that I use to utilize it for maximum impact? And I think that you can probably give some advice from the um, affiliate marketing side. Absolutely. I think to continue on Ruth's uh, thought, a really smart strategy to go after, we kind of call them the, the B-listers or even the C-listers in terms of the influencers. Um, the folks with the audiences won't necessarily charge you up front. So you, you do want to act serious. I always recommend if you're going to approach a YouTuber as Ruth did, one way to do it may be to say, uh, ask about a, a media kit if, if they've got one. That kind of shows that you're serious uh, about uh, getting getting engaged and, and maybe putting some money up front. But really, if we're on a limited budget, our goal is to do exactly what Ruth did. We oh, you muted yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, just, I just kicked my, yeah, thanks. <laughs> just kicked it with the elbow. Uh, what we want to do is do something on that commission only uh, basis. So that means uh, figuring out the channel that we want. So whether it's Instagram, whether it's YouTube, uh, whether it's Facebook, whether it's good old fashioned blogs or email lists, so kind of figure out the channel of what we're looking for. We may be looking for somebody with an email list of 10,000 where they would be happy to do that type of revenue share with us also. So it's, it is going to be a one-on-one -on -one approach on the recruitment side. I don't think there's a, there's a fast way to do it, but that would be my tip if, to get their attention, ask for that media kit. And again, if we can target that range where they're not quite looking for advertising money up front, we can sort of set up that commission only deal. That's going to help a lot with the budget. Fantastic. So Brett, I've got another question for you. This comes from Tim. And I thought this was a great question. I think that it's um, something that a lot of people struggle with as well. So Tim says, I have a product that requires a lot of educating before people buy. My product harmonizes all radiation fields that connect with a phone to make the phone safe. He explains the product. Okay. It's hard to get them to focus on this when I'm doing Facebook ads. What is the best way to sell a product where buyers need to be educated that A, there is a problem and B, that your solution is the best on the market? So it is a tricky one. Yeah, yeah that, that's a good one. So the two-step sales are always going to be a lot harder uh, to do than a one-step. So because you, you got to figure out the need and then you also got to convince them that your product is the best one. If it's possible to cut out the first step, mm. that's going to be helpful. So if you can cut that out and just say we're going to focus on, on, on maybe Google where people are actively searching for things, that's a way that you can possibly kind of cut out that first thing. Now, this is something that Nick can probably help with in terms of the traffic of the search words. Even if you're going to pay for ads, uh, you need to make sure that we're running ads on something, that there are keyword type searches. But that would be my first thought is that Google is probably a better place to look than Facebook because it at least lets us kind of cut out that first step of the process. And then if they're already looking for it, we can kind of convince them that we're the best product. Same from an SEO standpoint. So maybe go into Google, kind of type, start typing around for your keywords. You can see what types of sites there are. Those might be good sites to partner with also from an affiliate standpoint. So that could be another way that we kind of cut out the first part. If we're really convinced that we need to do both steps, then that first step is going to take more time. So that's where we're looking at. If we're doing the Facebook ads, get the email address 
And then we're going to want to do some follow-up emails to them, educate them, webcasts like this. Uh, same with Google. Maybe we're not going to sell the product right away. We're going to capture the email address and we're going to do some follow-up in between. So that's uh, the other side of it. If possible, see if we, see if we can uh, trim that first step to the greatest extent that we can. But otherwise, I think we're looking at some education here from the first contact to the possible sale. And what about, and Nick, I'm going to get to you in a second, but what about from the affiliate and the influencer part? Do you think that affiliates and uh, especially influencers these days, do you think that they have got a better job? They can do a better job by getting that across? Possible depends on the, again, depends on the, on the niche that we're looking at here. This is where I would go uh, look at Google and just kind of type in the keywords, go to social media, go to Instagram or wherever you think uh, this inform type of information is being shared. Facebook, Facebook groups. Uh, you might be able to find a Facebook group. There's Facebook groups on uh, many, many things. Uh, you may be able to uh, hook up with the organizer of the group and they often have a vested interest in that subject and that may be the affiliate or the influencer that you want to work with. So it's going to require a little bit of creative thinking, but go to the web, go to social media, put in the keywords, see what comes up and the people behind those websites, the people behind those social media profiles, the fan pages, those would be the types uh, that we, we'd want to partner with. Whether they say they're an influencer or not, we want to get to know them and, and see what it would take to work with them because they've got an audience that's already at least warmed up to some degree and again, gets us past that very first step. Exactly. And Nick, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I think the big thing I was going to add, uh, Brett's kind of touched on it anyway. Um, I, 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 at my business, we've split up conversions into categories now. So traditionally on Shopify, you would say a conversion is just a sale when actually we're looking at where does newsletter fall? In that because that's still a conversion they've converted now they are they're a customer but they're not quite paid yet but they're clearly keen because there's something to do here and um, a lot of these questions are relevant to this health supplement I mentioned earlier because they have exactly this challenge they have an incredibly complicated product they are so restricting what they can talk about and what we've actually done is created different avenues into the website so it has beauty elements to the um, in terms of benefits mm. of the product. It has sport. It has mental wellness. It has, but it's one product. It's it's just one product you take. And so what we've done is actually got some um, influencers and um, some well-known beauticians and health experts to write certain pieces of content that then get followed through on email. So actually, we can then we used to call it sort of sledgehammering, where we just hit Facebook with thousands of pounds of advertising and get the odd sale here and there, and it would pay for itself if they all stayed for a year. But actually, what we do now is we focus on trying to get people to sign up for a um, you know sign up to our free email list. You get ten emails over ten weeks explaining to you the um, all the different ways you can keep your skin clean, for example, and cleanse your skin every morning. And then every two or three emails is a subtle kind of you should buy this product, you should buy this product slipping in there and people actually start to convert on those even more which has then made us go well now we should be spending tens of thousands on facebook because we've got a proper funnel which we've never had and so i think that nurture process is so important and again depending on like Brett said, depending on the niche i'd also look at what associated content there is and what associated content you need mm -hmm. so if i'm buying a pair here I need to check the size I've never bought curtains before so I need to see a size guide or I need to see a color guide or understand what's the difference between eyelet or the ones that sort of clip on or the ones that just hook onto the bar you know all these different guides help and it's understanding your customer and their problems to then build the right content and then back to the earlier the earlier question of the journey at what point in the journey do they read all these different bits and pieces I think asking customers questions is the most important thing but always ask loaded questions trying to work out a specific thing um, with that question you ask and I'll just add to that from a marketing perspective, one thing that we're always taught that there's three different layers when it comes to where a person falls and you've got the person who has never heard of your product. They have no idea. They don't even know that there's an issue. You've got those two type of people. Then you've got the people that are at the stage where they're learning about your product and they're starting to understand, Hey, I've got this problem. What are the options for solving it? And then the third type of people are the people who are like, okay, I have this problem. I know I want a solution. And now I have to look between A, B, and C as the options. Now there's three different levels. And when it comes to advertising, it's a very, a very known fact once you start getting into especially paid advertising. And back when I started in online marketing, there was no option of Facebook, uh, Facebook organic and things like that. It was literally ads. That's all we were doing. Um, it was SEO or ads. So this very much fell into these two categories. And 
one thing that we're always taught is that when you're doing ads, the cheapest ads are the people at the bottom of the funnel, the people that know the problem, and now they're choosing between A, B, and C. The most expensive for those people at the top, which is what Brett said, if you can cut that part out, then you're going to be a lot better off because that's the most expensive um, try to p try, uh, type of person to convert because you're saying to them, you don't know that you have this problem, but I'm going to tell you that you need to buy this product, whether it's Nick's health product, whether it's in this case for this client, something to do with a mobile phone, whether it's me telling that a woman, she needs to buy red lipstick and she's never worn makeup in her life. And she's never even seen someone with makeup. And now I'm saying you need to have makeup. And she's like, hang on a second. What is that stuff? Trying to convince a person at that level is very, very much harder. So Nick and Brett both mentioned it. It's, you know, you've got to find out where you're trying to convert someone. And in this case for Tim, if you can get someone that already knows that they have a problem, you're going to be a lot better off than trying to get them. Well, it's going to be a lot cheaper for you. And as you get more money, then you try to target those people at the high end. And Nick for SEO, I'm sure that he always talks about this. When you're doing keywords for SEO, you're deciding on is the keyword um, harmonize radiation fields for the, um, uh, the example of this Tim person, harmonization of radiation fields is a keyword for SEO. Whereas what are radiation fields would be a learning keyword. So that's someone that really has no idea what this stuff is or why have I got a headache would be another one, which is I have no idea why I have a headache and now you're trying to teach them that. So you need to understand where that where you're sitting with people. That's going to make a big difference to your business. I want to cut to Nina because I think she might have something to add to this as well. Uh, yes, uh, Pinterest can also help um, to educate your potential customers. Um, I think Pinterest was discovered by bloggers and that they realized they get a lot of traffic. So um, it's it's a great place to educate your um, potential customers and you can you can get any kind of um sorry let me start again um, you can capture clients or customers or leads at any point of the journey so whether they are those that don't know they have a problem or those that are actively searching for and um, in this case I probably use the education and then use retargeting mm -hmm. ads to make sure that when they actually start realizing they have an issue and they're like, oh, maybe I need to do something, make sure the ad is, is there to get them again and again and again because the nurture process is long. Uh, it doesn't happen in an instant in most cases. So you just need to make sure that you are available or you're visible at every point of their journey. And Nina, that's actually a really good point because Nick mentioned before SEO, while we talk about it being free, it's not free. Um, Pinterest, you can actually do for free. So getting someone at that high end of when they're, they're learning about the pro problem, Pinterest would be, I totally agree, Pinterest would be my first place that I would say do that because SEO is going to cost you money. Um, ads are going to cost you money. Whereas Pinterest, if you learn a couple of things about it, you can do it for yourself for free and really get people at that top end. Yes, you can get started. And um, I would also recommend considering ads because they can be very, very affordable. On Pinterest. Like really affordable compared to any other channels. Um, it's still a developing platform in terms of ads. It's changing a lot. So they're not going to be cheap, as cheap for long. So I would definitely recommend giving it a go and see if it really works for your um, audience. Well, I tell people, I get probably about 70% of people that come to us at Just Ask Parker and they say, I want to run a Facebook ad. Can you organize it? And I always go, hang on a second. I don't think Facebook ads should be your first priority. Could be for some people, but I don't really think so. And Pinterest is usually the, the ad platform I send people to because it's by far the cheapest option. And yeah, it's definitely fantastic for a lot of different niches. Yes. And I recommend to all my clients to have um, the SEO part for Pinterest and then uh, retargeting ads just to make sure we capture everybody and there's con continued visibility for that person who visited the website. Fantastic. Uh, Ruth, do you have anything to add to that particular question when it comes to um, a product that needs education? Um, I've, I don't really have a lot to add because I think um, everything is kind of covered up really nicely, but I will add that if your website is not necessarily in English and you're 
audience is not global. Sometimes the smaller audiences are really difficult to target through Facebook because Facebook is really built for large audiences. So that's where places like Pinterest, like Nina talked about, and SEO can be amazing because while your audience is small, usually your um, competition would also be pretty small. So you would rank higher, higher in SEO easier and you would rank higher in Pinterest easier. So that's the only thing I have to add. Love it. Fantastic. Great advice. And Nick, and I think Brett might have some information on this as well. We'll start with you, Nick. What is the one biggest tip for optimal SEO? And this is from Tabitha. The biggest tip, I think, oh, where to start? I think, um, I think one, of the, one of the biggest things I would try and work out with SEO is what, and we kind of spoke about this with the funnel, work out what people's problems are, um, write a keyword list and go absolutely mad on it put stuff that's like, you know, if you sell any type of shoe, put the word shoe in, um, right the way down to an absolute, you know, five, six words, keywords, complete niche. Um, I would say write a keyword list and go absolutely mad on that keyword list. Go completely to town. Um, and the reason I say that is you never know what you can achieve. And also I would then review the keyword list very holistically. Obviously, you're not going to go after the word shoes unless you're a department store and have every type of shoe possible. Um, but look at it holistically and imagine that every single one of those keywords is a question or a problem. And we sometimes do this exercise with clients where we actually list out those questions and problems. And then we kind of go back to the funnel perspective and say, well, where are people in this journey? Because, I mean, what one client turned to us recently and said, um, oh, I've seen that on Google, if you ask a question, it comes up the question, you click it, and it pulls up a search result with the answer pulled out. And it's called a rich snippet, mm. and you can code it up. It's called, it's called structured data or schema, and it does a similar thing on Facebook as well. They sort of said, oh, we need those. And I said, you're probably right, but we've got to work out where this fits in the journey. And actually, if somebody's asking what on earth is invoicing software, they're probably not ready to become a customer. So actually, do we want to cover that? Probably not. They need to go and find zero or free agent, all these different online things. When they've got a thousand invoices a day being sent out or being received, then they need your product. And actually, they're going to be somebody who you target the CFO on LinkedIn. You know, that's going to be the journey. Mm -hmm. And actually, the stuff that happens on Google is them looking at particular um, server capacities for invoice inbound and outbound. And, you know, that is, that is a search term they will look for. Mm. Though we put the word invoicing on the keyword list, it was quickly crossed out and said, invoicing has all these other questions around it. What is invoicing? So that would be my, my biggest tip is really, really hone in on what people want to find out and then make your website about that. I think people get too, too certainly on Shopify, you can get so clogged up with the technical bits. You don't need to focus on the technical stuff. You just need a clear and presentable category and product structure that works for a customer, probably with... Mo Shopify is great that you won't get duplicate um, URL warnings if you put a product in 10 categories. So have 10 categories for it. If you think there's 10 different types of customer or 10 different shopping journeys, a customer will go on. Have a shop by this, shop by that, shop by this. You could even have shop by the day of the week I saw on one site, which did make wow. me smile. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that would be my advice is try and work out the customer's doing and build your business around that with some keyword data to, uh, to support. Fantastic. Brett, anything to add to that? Sure, yeah, to piggyback, uh, as you go through the journey as Nick described and, and figure out some keywords that are working, and I'll, I guess I'll use a personal example. Uh, we got a website based on shoes. I, I, you know, previous life, I would go red shoes, blue shoes, green shoes. I would write an article on each different types of shoes. And what we found to work well is if we kind of consolidate those articles and then we look for, and, and to Nick's point again, we're probably not going to focus on just shoes, but we might have a, a specific keyword phrase, four or five words that we found works really well. What we can do is take all of our smaller articles and put them into this sort of shoe manifesto, thousand words, 2000 words. I found that Google really likes that. So if you can uh, mm -hmm. kind of consolidate your, your efforts on your uh, website, you've got a couple content pieces, you put them in and that's the authoritative piece on uh, these certain types of shoes, you've got a nice shot of climbing up the rankings and, and maybe even getting all the way to that mythical top spot. Yeah. So it's no longer about trying to put out as many blog posts as you can. It's about putting together some really, yeah, Nick's like shaking his head, like no way, Brett's shaking his head. It's really about putting out some really great content that's longer. 
Nina, do you have anything to add? Because I think SEO, we all forget about Pinterest, but Pinterest is actually a great place for SEO. Yes, um, <clears throat> all the tips that were covered works in Pinterest as well. So get a niche it down, uh, don't try to capture everybody. And uh, Pinterest also tells you what people are searching for. So you can do keyword research, same way you can do it on Google. So <clears throat> go there and start researching, start to think about your customer, what are they actually looking for? And then you, Pinterest will tell you what people are searching for. And you can use that information in your profile, in your pins, um, in your website. And you can even combine the information you got from Pinterest with Google and see how you can kind of merge them because pins are indexed on Google as well. So you kind of get potentially two search engines with one pin. Love it. And Ruth, anything from you? Yeah, so um, one of the things you really need to focus on when you work on SEO for your website is getting backlinks. And it's kind of difficult for e-commerce a lot of the times to actually get backlinks. But if you actually use your website to also educate and create a whole blog with a really good blog post like Brett mentioned, you can pretty easily reach out to other websites in the same niche and see if they can link back to you, uh, get a do follow link, and it will really help you rank up your SEO faster. Fantastic. And Ruth, I'm going to stay with you. I've got a question here from Tion. And the question is, how can I get to 1,000 sales fast? That is what our actual panel is about. So how could they get 1,000 sales fast? What would be your recommendations? Yeah, so obviously you really need to, we've talked a lot about getting traffic to your website, but you also need to make sure that your website is optimized. Your store has to be something that people would a, trust when they look at it. It needs to look like an actual legitimate business, which is something that a lot of beginners in Shopify fail at. So it starts from um, your copywriting has to be on point and your colors need to be need to match. Um, your pictures need to look professional. Um, and that's, that's actually not enough. You need to look at the whole funnel uh, and actually see that if someone buys once you don't want to you don't want it to end there so you need to make sure you're a collecting uh, distribution lists so there's email facebook sms push notifications i think these are the strongest ones at the moment so if you collect these customers or even just visitors into those distribution lists you can use it to reach out to them even if they didn't buy anything and they left your website to convert them for the first time and you can also use it to reconvert them if they've bought once and then never came back again, to actually send deals to them. And then lastly, of course, I have to talk about the thank you page because it is a really good opportunity to do um, like a reconversion uh, process with your customers where they get there and they actually get a pop-up saying, hey, thank you for buying. For the next 20, 20 minutes, you get a 50% off everything or you get a specific offer for people who've just bought and it's a one-time offer, it's not going to be available anymore. It's a really good way to get a customer to actually buy again directly. And obviously you need to get the customer to the thank you page. But once you do, it makes sure that you're doubling up the value from each customer that you actually get. And Ruth, on that note, I think that I just thought of something that, and I think a lot of people don't realize this. Technically on Shopify, if someone purchases from you, they're not on your email list because, well, the law in Europe is that you cannot have that box ticked. Um, so that's actually against the law in Europe already. And that will be coming in in the US very, very shortly. So you actually cannot add someone to your marketing list after they have purchased from you legally unless they have ticked that box. Um, and that's where I think Ruth, your uh, app comes in handy because someone has purchased the product. They might have unticked that box if you had it ticked or not ticked it. And now you cannot technically market to them. You can say to them, there's an invoice. You can tell them, give them a receipt, but you can't say, Hey, we've got this special offer coming up. So your thank you page actually comes into play there and you can say, Hey, did you know you're not on our marketing list? And to make sure you're getting the next offer, you should actually sign up. Yeah, and something we also talked about uh, when I was on your podcast is that the thank you page in Shopify actually turns into the order confirmation page, the order status page. So your customers tend to visit 
this specific page more than once. And it's a really good opportunity to, even if they left and it's been a week and they get a shipping update email from Shopify, they get a link back to this page and they can actually go in and see all offers again. So even if they passed out on them for the first time, they might actually opt in the second or third time. So it's, it's a really good opportunity to get marketing that's legal and you're not breaking any laws. Um, and also you're not paying any money to get the customer to this page. I mean, he's already on your website. You already purchased. Shopify has already sent that message out. Yeah. So it's all an automated yeah. message that goes out. Um, Nick, do you have anything to uh, give advice for, for how people can get their first thousand sales fast? I do. Yeah. I think we, I was going to butt in early when we were talking about advertising um, briefly on this and the, the moment wasn't right, but I thought I've got to add this before we finish. Um, I, I run my own Shopify store and I'm about to sell it as well. So um, I'm kind of in the same boat. Um, but for me, one of the, the two, there are two numbers that I think every Shopify store owner needs to focus on. One is average order value and one is lifetime value. And that will then start to answer almost all the questions we've had today about where do I invest money? How do I reach a thousand sales? Um, absolutely just hit nail on the head in terms of getting that repeat business. Um, I'll give you an example because this is always the example I use on, I have it on a slide deck and every client we talk to, I put it there. Certainly when, when there's options of repeat business, something's, it's just, it is one time, you know, especially if you're ordering a, a lung transplant or something, we hope it's one time. But, um, but yeah, when it's, when it's repeat business, if you imagine in the UK, ASOS are enormous here. I know in a lot of countries, they're very big. How much do you think ASOS is willing to pay per new customer purely on Google ads? And I don't know the answer. This is just hypothetical. Um, not. Or I do know, and I'm not allowed to say, but the, um, yeah, how much are they willing to pay versus the same product being sold on a website that just sells shoes or sunglasses or one particular item? How much do you think they're willing to pay versus ASOS? Probably four or five times more. Exactly. Uh, sometimes much more than sometimes 20 to 30 times yeah. from, from the numbers I've seen. Um, and that, but unfortunately that is playing field because you are bidding per click. And if they look at your website, they probably also look at ASOS. And so I think in terms of getting your first thousand sales, have a very, very clear plan and a full understanding of who the customer is. And I appreciate when it's first thousand, you don't really know the customer and often business is often described as you set sail heading east and end up almost indefinitely going southwest or north by the, uh, by the time you actually reach somewhere. Um, but I think it's, you've got to be so, so trigger happy with those emails. It doesn't mean you send a lot, but it means you have to follow up. Um, we, we sent our first first ever email to a day space recently for a white goods company and um, selling dishwashers, ovens. Um, and we said, look, you guys have been trading for 15 years now, mostly on eBay and Amazon. So our challenge is set. We need to get sales through the website where we're not relying on these platforms. Platforms are great. Um, but we sent our first email out and we said, look, every five years, whatever product they bought five years ago, they're going to need it again in five years because that's mm. the average time you'd have one. Plus you've now got five years to offer them every single other product that you offer because they're going to need all of them in that five year space. So suddenly you've got customers buying a product per year, which is 500 pounds now per year of revenue rather than just one 500 pounds. So that instead of spending 6% of their revenue on PPC now, um, of PPC revenue, they now spend near a 20% because they believe they can make almost up to 50% of the original, making more profit long-term. They're thinking long-term now. Um, I know we spoke about Tony Robbins a while ago, um, Caroline. First thing I read in one of his books was make more decisions and make them purely based on long-term. So sorry for the rant. I just think it's, oh, it's so interesting, interesting to understand the commercials of this because that defines budget. Defines great. Fantastic. Love it. Nina, you're next in line. So have you got any advice for a thousand sales for the first thousand sales? <laughs> um, yes. Um, um, on Pinterest, I would focus on uh, both uh, ranking on, um, on SEO on your keywords and me really target highly targeted keywords. Don't go for that shoe. Just actually look for the long, the long tail keywords uh, because you can rank faster. Uh, when you create a pin, don't add keywords and hashtags because you can do both in Pinterest. And then I would recommend investing a little bit of money on ads so that um, if you get a click or when you get a click, you can retarget back to that person. And because most people don't buy from uh, in the first visit because they don't know you, you're just random Shopify store they landed on. 
you just kind of need to remind them like, hey, I'm here, you know, <laughs> come back. And um, you can do that pretty affordably with retargeting ads um, on Pinterest. And I think you got to look at the numbers, whether it's Pinterest, SEO, Facebook, look at your numbers. Don't believe on what you think might be working. Actually look at a data, Google Analytics, whatever analytics you have on any platform and literally love your data because that's going to tell you which way you should be going, whether Pinterest is working, it's not working. You should be on Facebook, Instagram, wherever. So data, just, I know nobody loves to look at data and Excel and it's like, oh, geez, no, but that's the one thing I think everybody should do. So ninety percent of people do not ever look at their analytics. Like people have said yeah. to me, I don't even know how to log in, mm -hmm. and I cannot stress like if you just look at your analytics. I, the guys have already mentioned it today. Yeah. Both Brett and Nick have mentioned it. You know these sort of things that you find out makes you understand what you should be yeah. doing. And if you don't know those things, and Ruth's even mentioned it, if you don't know these things, you're never going to be successful. Yes, it's so important and. Um, you want you have to learn it only once once you learn it sit down have a cup of coffee and just sit down and watch a training video or whatever to really understand what it's about and once you do i bet you fall in love with your data you can't wait to actually go back when you understand it and you can really see those graphs going up and down and see okay this is i know now what i did wrong and i know what i did right and it's become easy to make decisions from there on and I'll give a tip because of um, Nina, come over to justaskparker.com and have a look for our free training section. And there's a workshop I did with Nina and everyone that's done that workshop has just gone, oh my God, talk about getting free traffic with Pinterest and how she's actually explained it. Super simple. Definitely go and watch that as well. It's definitely going to be helpful to a lot of people. So Nina, thank you. All my clients love it. And Brett, do you have any uh, other tips about getting your first thousand sales? I think they've all been great. So Nina's point on retargeting, uh, very set up that retargeting code as, as soon as you can. I've also, in my experience, worked well uh, across the Google network, Facebook networks. So start retargeting as soon as you get that initial traffic. The next point on ads, ads are going to be the quickest way to get traffic to your site. Um, to your point, Caroline, you're probably going to have to overpay for that traffic initially. But if you think about it in your overall uh, sort of scheme portfolio of things. You kind of have to, you got to get some traffic coming in, got to get some traction. You need some data to pull from. So if a year from now you look back and you say, hey, I overpaid for traffic a year ago, at least you got some sales going. So we kind of do need that initial traction. And, um, you know, from the influencer side, I think Ruth's exercise earlier on going to those uh, approachable, shall we say, whether they're YouTubers or Instagrammers or Facebookers or email lists, uh, whatever they are, that's also a good thing. You're going to have, you're going to want to do a few things. Uh, you got to get a few things going, obviously to get to a thousand. Uh, so these are the types of, I think, efforts that, that you want to have in place. I guess the one thing I would add is uh, maybe chop a zero or two off. So it's not too intimidating. So if, you, if you're at zero, focus on getting the one sale, if you're at one, think about getting a five or 10 and that's how you do it. It's always kind of taking that next step. So a thousand, um, it's, it's a great goal. It can be a little overwhelming if you're at zero so that you can kind of maybe step that back and you go to one and then you get to five or 10 and then you get to 50 and that's how you, you do it from there. I love that Brett because I came up with a thousand sales and that's really what my whole motto is because the amount of people that were coming to me saying, I want to make a million dollars this year. And I was like, Whoa, calm down a bit. Let's talk about the first thousand, but you're so right. Like bring it right down to how do you get that first sale? Forget the rest of them because if you can't get one, you're never going to get a thousand of them. Um, and your mum buying your product as a, you know, as a nice thing to do is not a sale. So you've got to actually think it through. I will give two points on that. Two of the biggest things I think, and there's a couple of questions there. Zach actually asked, I've got it here in front of me. He's got two different audiences. He's got old men looking for hiking products and then he's got kids learning about hiking, blah, blah, blah. There's a few other people that mentioned um, their different audiences as well. I can say that the two things that I would say when it comes to getting your first thousand sales or like Brett said, the first couple um, Understand your customer, first of all. If you don't understand your customer and who you're selling to, all of the marketing efforts in the world are going to be wasted. You're going to waste your time doing ads. You're going to waste your time on Pinterest doing the wrong things. You're going to waste your time with SEO doing the wrong keywords. 
So you've got a product, you've got to understand who you're selling to. So customer, I cannot stress how important that is. I've got the most amazing free um, video training on the website that just goes through it and everyone that does it is blown away because I'm really passionate about understanding your customer. That's my first thing. And then the second thing is forget the actual traffic numbers. We all talk about, oh, I got a thousand people to my website. Forget about the people that are coming to your website. Start thinking about how you're actually converting them. And we got this question a lot during um, the questions that I had here. People saying, I'm getting a lot of traffic, but no one's converting into sales. And I want the guys to answer this in a second as well. But when it comes to conversions, um, Ruth mentioned it before as well. I think Nina mentioned something about it as well, that make sure your website's trustable because if you do not, if your website doesn't look like it's trustable, you'll never get sales. And Nick mentioned the difference between um, like an ASOS, which is a big clothing store compared to a little one. The amount of people that come to our website to just ask Parker and ask for a website audit. And they show me these websites and we ask them, who are your three competitors? And they give me like ASOS as a competitor. And then they show me their website. They've got the data from AliExpress that they've just thrown on their website. So it's got all like half of it's written in Chinese writing. Um, it, the pictures are terrible. And then I say to them, you've given me ASOS as your competitor and you're asking me what your problem is. Like, just have a look at what ASOS is doing. How do you think you're competing with that? And if you're not getting those conversions, there's probably those things going on. You're probably, your websites aren't just scratch, you're not trustable. Um, you don't have phone numbers on there. You don't have great photos, things like that. So forget the numbers of people coming to your website. Start looking at how to convert those people into traffic. Traffic. So that's my advice for your first thousand sales. Um, I'm going to go back. We're going to finish up on some conversion things. So as I said, I want each of you to sort of give a last final point because I think conversions are so important. Um, we'll go backwards through the line. So I'll start with Brett. But sort of the questions that I've got here, there's a couple here. I'll read them out. You can answer them how you want to. Someone said, how to spot where the conversion problem is. Uh, what uh, what is the industry benchmarks for traffic to sales? So the conversions, um, real expectations for my first 90, 120 days. Um, one of my personal clients, um, Russ, he actually wrote in a question asking how to increase conversion rates. So if you can give us sort of some ideas of what you think about when it comes to conversions, Brett, we'll start with you. Sure, Caroline. So if we're starting with a new website, we got to get traffic to it first, preferably high quality traffic. But hey, if we're just trying to get traffic to it, let's see if we can get 100 unique visitors a day and, and sort of build from there so that we, at least we've got a base to work with. So I think if you've got 100 or more, you've got something that you can now look at and look at the analytics and look at just your conversions. Now, let's say we're not selling anything. So let's take a step back and say, well, are we asking for the sale? Is it sale or nothing? If so, maybe we can get an email address. Maybe we can get a follow on social media in between. So I would encourage you to, to get going in between because it is, of, uh, especially starting out, to go from that click to the So let's get some steps in between. That gives you something to measure. So then we can, well, today we had 105 visitors to our website. We got five new email addresses. And maybe we had one sale, maybe zero sales, but at least it gives us something to build on and we can focus on getting more and more email addresses. I think you find that as you strengthen the front end of that sale, it will help on the back end. I would look at every website as its own case. I think that these uh, benchmarks are tough because everyone on this panel can tell, show you how to get a thousand visitors to your website in the next hour and they're not necessarily good or high quality traffic that's gonna convert. So I think it's all about the quality of it uh, first, so if you focus on your own personal uh, website sales funnel, to your point, have it look great, uh, have it be a, a trustworthy site, and then kind of see if we can do the baby steps and walk people up to the conversions. I guess one final point then, I've fallen in love with live chat over the last five or six years. We have it on all of our websites, uh, seven days a week. Uh, we can go 24 on our way to going 24 seven. That's great because you will get people who will hit the, the chat person that you mother, otherwise you would not hear from. It's a great way, especially initially keep your ears open. It may not pay for itself in terms of your investment or ROI, but I think that initial feedback's priceless that you'll get from just kind of talking to the visitors who do land on your website. 
Sorry, I muted myself. Fantastic, Brett. That is great. And Nina, do you have anything that you want to give advice on? Um, just something general, not necessarily specific on Pinterest, but um, I think it's really important to map out your customer journey, where they come from, where do they land, and make sure that they're converting or how they are converting on different steps of the funnel. And really focus on your checkout process. Um, that actually kills a lot of conversions because there's too many things they need to fill out, unnecessary information. So make sure it's really, really smooth and, um, um, and really encourages the conversion. Yeah, great advice. I'll just make a point then that Brett mentioned, and I think it's a really good point, like he said about the emails and getting people to convert at different um, points. There was a really good interview I did in the summit last year for the Influencer Marketing Summit. And one of the guys mentioned that it takes on average 14 touch points to convert someone from never hearing about you into a sale. Um, Nick mentioned ASOS as a brand. That's a brand that spends a lot of money on marketing. So their touch points are happening on a regular basis. And you probably just don't even realize like they're sending out emails, they're doing ads, 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 and people are going to the website. Oh, I need a you know new black top. Now I'm going because I want a pair of jeans. I'm not buying anything, but I'm just looking and looking and looking. They are all touch points. So you need to be creating those touch points. And like Brett said, it's emails, uh, making sure people sign up for an email list. That is the difference between someone never hearing about you until turning them into a sale. So there's a lot of the steps in between. So Nick, do you have anything else to add to that? Yes, sorry, I saw a notification saying Caroline's trying to unmute me. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I get asked that, you touched on this, Brett, the, the benchmarking question, like what's the industry average, where should we be? And um, I won't name names, but I was in front of a financial director recently of a re quite, quite an early start retail brand. They're doing about £200,000 a month in revenues. So they're, they're off the ground. And she sort of said to me, um, how, you know, what should our conversion rate be? At the moment, it's like 2%. Is that good or bad? I said, well, it's phenomenal, given that that's across every single traffic source. And I think that is my point. Is you, When you're looking at the data, you have to look at it in silo. Um, if you're paying for advertising, I, want, I, I don't even want to see a high or low conversion rate. I'd happily take 0 0.50 noughts and then a one percentage if I'm making good profit in my business. I, I'd happily just scale that, keep the percentage the same and scale the volume. Vice versa, if your products, you only make one pound profit, it's stupid spending 30 pounds trying to sell it unless you can sell 15 or 20 to actually reach you know, terminal velocity sort of point where you make profit from the thing. Um, it's why subscription businesses are able to advertise themselves. Um, there's like razor blade um, brands in the UK advertising on TV because it's so profitable. And so I think with conversion, I think I would always say keep the buy button available at all times and try and educate your customers to a point where they're ready to convert, work out what those barriers are. Um, and like I said earlier about the different levels of conversion, I think newsletter, if we're spending money and getting people on newsletter, but we can't quantify that they're then buying a product, if they're just taking this free content, that has to stop. And so you've got to work out different conversions coming from different sources. Um, I think it's the real key to look at it. And even clients have just recently, our SEO conversion rate's not high enough. And I said, well, you're paying three or four grand a month to have the SEO done, but you're making nearly a million pounds a month in revenue. What's wrong with your conversion rate? Like this... I've got clients who are murdered for this, you know, like, this sounds great. And so I just think, I think keep it in context. And I think going back to the kind of financials is to get it, get it all weighed up. And I think things like social proof, like reviews and Instagram feed where customers are sharing stuff, just, just showing a bit of life that actually this brand is being bought, it's being used or worn or whatever the, the product is, I think can be really key to boost the conversion rate. But I think keep it in context. Um, otherwise, if you see your Pinterest traffic's not converting, you might be really upset. And then you remember how much work it was to get a really good traffic source. Actually, it's fine. It's fine as it is probably. So um, yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, love it. Fantastic. And Ruth, anything else that you want to add to that? Yeah, so I just want to add to what Nick said. I really agree with, uh, you don't really need to look at what should my conversion rate look like? What should it be? Um, obviously, you always want to improve this metric. But in the beginning, when you don't really have a lot of traffic and a lot of sales, focus on your ROI. How much does it cost to get someone? And how much uh, money by average does a customer spend on your store? If your 
average order value is higher than the, the sum that you pay to get the customer per sell, then you're good, you're okay, and you can just focus on getting more and more sales before you even start talking about the conversion rate. Um, now, I agree with a lot of the things you guys said. Uh, I have to say for trust, um, one of the best things to do is also to get um, featured on or get uh, actually social proof from someone who already has an audience and already has credibility. And I mentioned before, maybe that's because I, I see a lot of Shopify store owners who are not native English speakers, but have an English store. It's really important that it sounds like someone who is a native speaker in whatever language you are uh, creating it in, uh, wrote it. So if your English is good enough, you can use free tools like uh, Grammarly to actually improve uh, your grammar. And if you're not, just hire someone off of Fiverr or Apple to actually write copyright for you. Um, and lastly, again, you guys already mentioned uh, the fact that people don't buy on their first visit. Uh, and Brad mentioned um, the, the live chat support. I really mm -hmm. think that you can kind of combine uh, distribution lists and support in this way. Uh, if you add a chatbot from Facebook, which is actually free, you don't have to pay for that. You actually get people who um, try to talk to you via your support chat. Uh, you get them into your distribution list and you can actually use it to later market to them. So. Find those touch points in your store when they're already on the pages that you can actually reach out to them, whatever it is the um, exit intent pop up, or if it's just when they're kind of browsing the website and after a few seconds you show up a pop up with a discount or your chat. Don't like, don't overwhelm them with pop ups to get them to, to your distribution list, but find other places. And actually, one more point um, is. To get a good fit between your uh, customers, your visitors, and your products. So especially that's especially important if you're a dropshipper, if you're not creating your own product, then a lot of the times what people would do is they find a product that's already highly successful and very um, saturated and try to succeed in that. But that has a lot of competition. So what you want to do is actually find products that are not successful yet, or you see there's some interest, you can do some keyword research and see if people are looking for this kind of product. And you think this product has the potential to be successful, but it's not overly saturated. And then what you have to do is make sure that you bring the correct people into your store. You don't want to get just cheap traffic from people who either don't have the money to pay for your product or uh, not in the locations that you are selling for, or just don't are not really interested in the product. Love it, fantastic. So, Ruth, before we finish up, I want each of you to just remind everyone what your website is, what in your case, Ruth, your app, how people can find it. Highly recommend everyone watching this to make sure that they go and download Ruth's app. It is seriously amazing, and it's free. So it's not going to cost you anything until you start making a certain amount of sales, but just remind everyone and then we'll go back through the list and say goodbye to everyone because we've been on here for over an hour already. Yeah. So as I mentioned, our website is still your apps.info. We also have a blog there that you can use to um, get some resources to get you started and you can find us if you search for reconvert in the Shopify app store. Reconvert. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Ruth. That's been wonderful. And Nick, tell us your website again, where everyone can find you. Yeah, you can find us at spec.digital. Um, that's our website. We've actually just launched a new thing that I haven't shown Caroline yet. Um, it's called the Learning Center. And we've actually got an e-commerce um, guide. Um, it's not super in-depth, but it's enough to get you started. Um, so go and check out the Learning Center. There's a few other guides and stuff on there as well. Sorry, I don't know if everyone else lost that, but I just lost that. What was on the learning platform again? Sorry, yes, we've got a page on our website called Learning Center, um, and there's a whole load of free guides on there. One of them is an SEO um, for Shopify. So go and check it out. It's all about e -com. How do you get your first few customers in? That sort of stuff. So um, yeah, go and download that. And there's no email gate. You can just go in there, access it as it is. Oh, fantastic. Well, I, on that note, will tell everyone, I just realized looking at this panel, what had just happened and I didn't actually connect it until just before. 
I've got the course 1000salesandbeyond.com. I've got the full program there, but I actually have free access. You get like, uh, there's like 30 lessons in there. And I realize all four of you actually have at least one video training module inside that course. So that's fantastic. Everyone's part of it. So head over to 1000salesandbeyond.com and you get access to something from all of these guys that um, are teaching you about e-commerce. But Nina, tell us your website and how people can contact you. Uh, yes, my website is profitablepen.com and I have a lot of, a lot of blog, blog posts about uh, Shopify marketing on Pinterest. Fantastic. And Nina's amazing. And if you haven't heard the podcast, you haven't seen the workshop, you need to see it. It is fantastic. It's really, really good. And Brett, tell us about your two little projects that you have going on. No, they're very big. big <laughs> sure. Thanks, Caroline. Yeah. So the first little project is our affiliate tracking app. It is available in the Shopify app store as well. So it's lead dino, L-E-A-D-D-Y-N-O. That'll help you set up that affiliate program and keep track of all the great affiliates and influencer partners that you're going to reach. And then our newer website and brand is going to help you get in front of influencers. So if you're looking to get your brand um, in front of, and we cover a variety of niches from health, uh, clothing, beauty, travel, influencer.com will get you there. A F L U E N C E R.com. So like influencer, but uh, a list type on, uh, on our website. And for everyone, we've got the summit coming up soon. It launches in a month's time. Brett's actually part of that summit. He was part of last year's summit and he had an amazing response. So he's back again this year. And um, like I said, 1000salesandbeyond.com, there is information there on all four of these people and they bring all of their expertise to my program as well. And of course, I'll send you an email with the link of the recording of this session because I know we were talking very fast and there was a lot of things that we covered. I know that we didn't actually cover all the questions. I will be making sure that I get some more questions out via video, via podcast and things like that. I'm going to send the list of questions through to the four people that were on the panel today. And if they can help in any other way, maybe they put together a blog post and we send you the link and things like that. But I'll let you know via email. So thank you everyone for joining and to the guests, the experts. Thank you so much for being here. It's been amazing and you've been so helpful. So thank you for everyone being here. Bye, everyone. Bye.